Well, first of all, I want to say uh, what a wonderful privilege it is for, for, for me to be talking to, to, to Carl and, and, and Carl, uh, how great to see you there and uh, uh, sort of a big welcome to this. And I might say this is Carl's idea that he, he was giving uh, this seminar and he said, "Well, why don't we turn into into a little a little hard talk, which uh, uh, which f fantastic for me." Uh, so a great in it, Carl's initiative. Uh, a couple of things about I mean the uh, I'll, I'll be talking a lot about Carl just now, but about the hard talk. Hard talk has seen at uh, some time since it was operational, and you notice that I've even put a tie on because I always put a always had a tie on, and particularly for Susan, and these glasses I always used to wear, which were my father's uh, spectacles. Uh, I'm not wearing them today, but I still got them. And Susan noticed uh, the, the, the socks that characterize uh, every one of those hard talks. And, and, and as I'm only waist up, uh, I've got them, I'm carrying them. Anyway, what a, a little bit of a history, a hard talk. I mean, the, the, um, the, there was a, the, the history, Hard talk has often focused very much on the, the politics. The history of it was that instead of the annual planning meeting where people would get up and give a talk uh, and then they'd go over time and there was no room for discussion, there were a few issues selected every year to say, well, let's focus on some of the issues that are problem areas or we want to know more about. And so that's where the hard talk started to focus on, on particular uh, areas. Um, a couple of changes is one is I left Uri quite a long time ago, so I'm not up with all of the politics, uh, but, uh, but nevertheless, I will have introduced a little bit of the politics, and, uh, but and this time the focus is very much on Carl, uh, who, is, who, who is leading. And, and, and uh, so, I mean, let me start off, Carl. I mean, why are you leaving? I mean, why are you leaving? <laughs> is, it, is, it, is it politics or career advancement or, or uh, why, why are you going? Um, I can say yes. <laughs> so all the, all the above, although in, in, in different sort of orders of um, sort of importance, I suppose. Um, most, mostly, honestly, probably two things. Um, one would, would be kind of career progression. And, you know, the opportunity that I have at Oklahoma State. Um, so for those of you that don't know, I'll be going to Oklahoma State um, next month. Um, I will wear three hats. I will be the director of their Master of International Agriculture program, which is an interdisciplinary program that prepares uh, master students for international careers uh, from a variety of different ag, ag fields. So not just economists, but nutritionists, food scientists, animal scientists, vets, and so on. So a really nice opportunity to kind of use the skills that I've that obtained at Ilry to, to help kind of shape careers. But then also okay. have a professor kind of share uh, as well. So. Go ahead. No, and, and, I mean, yeah, and yeah. Carry on. I mean, you have yeah. left before, Carl. You've left. I have left a, well, before. yes and no, though. I have left before and I haven't, though, right? Because, I mean, if you look at my, my tenure at Ilry, at Ilry um, you know, I've essentially been continuously affiliated in some fashion or form with Ilry since 2006. You know, even though that I left in 2008 as full time staff. I never really left, you know, I was still working okay. as a D or consultants. Um, so, you know, the business cards and locations change, but the affiliation with Ilri has actually been pretty constant. You know, I've, I've actually had, you know, a long, you know, you know, now 15 year affiliation with, with Ilri, whether, whether as staff or as a, as a collaborator. And that's okay. been, you know, you know, a big one. So, so, you know, I, I've left and I haven't. So, you know, I, I guess it depends how, how, how administratively um, pure you want to look at this. Well, I, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that a little bit, but I'm look, picking up on your on your Oklahoma State uh, University. I mean, is this? I was going to start off by saying, you know, are you are, are you still searching for utopia, and is uh, Oklahoma State the utopia that you are, you are looking for? I, I, I sure hope I'm, hope I'm not looking for utopia, and I'm not sure if Oklahoma itself is utopia. Um, but the, the, <laughs> honestly, the well, I mean, I mean, it's you know there. It, it, I'll tell you what, though. I mean, when I went there in May for the first time, and I'd never been to Oklahoma before last month, um, I was actually quite surprised about how how friendly and personable a place it was. Okay. Um, you know, it was it was something that people are genuinely very nice, very friendly, very really down to earth, and and that I really 
I think put me a, a little bit at ease because I'd, I'd never been to that part of the world before. Um, and so that was actually quite nice. Okay. Um, is it utopia? I'm not sure anywhere really is. Um, you know, for me, I, you, you'd ask some of the reasons. So one is career, one, one also is personal. And, you know, I've, you know, I'm at a stage of my life personally, you know, where I have, you know, two small kids, which I didn't before, you know, in, in yes. my other decisions with, with Hillary. Um, you know, my oldest daughter will be starting kindergarten next year. And, yes. you know, I sort of harken back to my past a little bit. You know, my, my father was in the Navy. And between the time I was born and the time I was five, you know, we had moved, you know, 10, 12 times. And, you know, and we, we settled in, in Southern California when I was five and we basically stayed put um, until I went to college. And he left active duty military as a result to keep the family kind of, you know, in one place for the stability of the family. And I sort of see myself in a kind of a similar situation in my life personally, you know, where, yeah. you know, it's time for really for the children, especially to have that stability of a place and okay. not bounce around. It's, it's, it's one thing for me and my wife to kind of go off on adventures every, you know, two, three, four years. Um, it's different with kids. And so I think yeah. you know, from that standpoint and sort of learning from my own background, I mean, I think there are real benefits from kind of establishing some more and being some more that is a, a permanent position. I mean, Oklahoma State is it, a, as tenured as it gets. So yeah. you know, from that standpoint, you know, giving that stability is, is really, really important from that standpoint. Okay. Now I understood that that was also a, 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 a big part of it. I mean, the, uh, the, the, the School of Global Studies uh, is uh, 20 years old, so it's a younger institution than than Hillary, which is what, 45 or something like mm -hmm. this. But I notice you're one of these Humphrey endowed chairs in the School of Global Studies. And I also notice that there are six of them. So there are a lot to, you've got to have a bit of, bit of jostling there. I mean, do they all have different roles? I mean, you've got to get on with them all. So that's going to be a little interesting challenge. Tell me more about that. Yeah, the, the global chairs, basically the, there are different global, there are different chairs for different uh, parts of the, of, of the university. And so mine is associated with the, with the College of Agriculture. There are other chairs in different parts of the university. Um, the whole purpose of the chair is really, it's, it provides funding to support student scholarships and student experiences overseas. And so I'll control, okay. if I'm not mistaken, somewhere around $80,000, $90,000 a year to, to send students to different places overseas. You know, so basically to support scholarships. Within the master's program that, that I'll be managing, um, students are required to spend, you know, four to eight weeks overseas to get some sort of international experience. And that can be with a research organization or an NGO or kind of some other kind of international kind of industry or partner. Um, and sometimes those are funded directly by the host. And sometimes those are, those are, those are, those are funded by the, the, the chair. One of the conditions of the chair, which I think is actually really neat, is that it funds international experiences, but they have to be in developing countries. So they're not allowed to be in Western Europe. So, so they, they don't fund, you know, four weeks in Tuscany. You know, you're supposed okay. to go somewhere to, that, you know, got, community. If I can interrupt, I've got a couple of questions on that, though. I mean, one is, uh, one is the, the, the fact that you're sending out students, uh, American students. Uh, one of the great challenges that we've had at Ilri is building, I mean, is building, sending, getting students involved and, and educating students has been fine. It's strengthening institutions uh, that has always been the challenge uh, so that those, those students can stay in Africa or wherever the country are, is and not be catapulted back through the, the sort of career development type of thing that you're looking at into uh, that. So that's one point. The other point is that in it, in, there is more, more and more skepticism about Westerners going to, uh, as visiting students, to different developing countries. I mean, great for experience, and I encourage it, but you've got to somehow, they've got to be fitted in in the right way with the right political links and, 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 and not this, you know, we're coming in to sort of sort your problems out type of thing. How do you respond to that? No, I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a valid point. Um, for me, I'm, I'm looking at it from a different angle um, in terms of trying to, to enrich Americans who are often not very worldly to go overseas. Yeah. And I think from that standpoint, you know, this kind of experience is, is, is incredibly eye-opening. You know, a student you know, that's you know, coming from rural Oklahoma you know, on, on, a, on a large farm that hasn't been you know, 50 Ks from, from where they've lived to suddenly catapult them somewhere where they can actually use some of their skills and mutually learn. So it's not just about them kind of going in there and having all the answers, 
but to instill upon them sort of, you know, you're there to, to learn and they're to learn from you. And so I think as long as that kind of communication is two way and that it's not sort of extractive yeah. and that's not that's the point of the program at all. It's really to try to give our students a flavor in terms of what international work looks like, but then hopefully for others to learn from them in terms of their experiences, because okay. there might be parts of mutual learning. And that, that's what I really want to encourage there. It, it shouldn't be just that kind of, you know, we, we have all the answers. We're going in there to, you know, dive, to dive bomb and, 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 and take over. It's really a learning process. I noticed that, uh, that Tom Randolph just made a note saying, you're reinventing the Peace Corps. <laughs> I like <laughs> Actually, well, funny, funny that Tom mentions that, though. One of the parts of our program, it, although it stopped a few years ago, um, there actually is a returning Peace Corps kind of components to it. And so a number, so, so students, that the people that have come from the Peace Corps have, have had an opportunity to actually take the master's program and use that experience as a kind of a credit to what they've done for their degree. Um, they are going to, one of the things I, I really want to do is to see if, if there's ways to, to reestablish that. that, that, that returning Peace Corps program stopped in 2016. So this wasn't a Trump thing, it was before that. And I'm not sure if it was done administratively within Peace Corps or what the, the history of that is, but it is something I would like to, to kind of look at. One kind of interesting area of student um, enrollment, I mean, there's, there's about 45, 50 students in, in, in the program at any one time, but there are a handful of people from the military and you know, military students, so, so these, are, these are students that are like on active duty. There, there was one student currently in Afghanistan who is you know, doing all, all sort of kind of, you know, kind of work, you know, kind of you know, support, kind of operation type work. And you know, using that, that as part of their international experience to so actually kind of, you know, kind of you know, look, look at what they're going to do you know, post, post you know, military career. And I think that's kind of interesting. You know, trying to find ways of trying to link those kinds of perspective students into that. Okay, no, fantastic. Uh, I, um, we come back to that a little bit, but I want to do a few, uh, look at a few other things. I mean, uh, you and I first met in, I think it was 2004 in, uh, in, in, in India, where you were just joining um, uh, IFPRI. Uh, you just finished your PhD, uh, and you just, jo you just uh, joined IFPRI as a, as, a, as, a, as a research fellow. Um, and uh, I mean, but, and, and then latterly, uh, you've been involved in policy, so central to your work has been policy. Would you not better have been stayed in IFPRI all the time? It wasn't IFPRI the perfect institution for you and the and the economics to, to the policy. Yes and no. Um, you know, I, I think it looked look this in two different ways. Um, from a livestock standpoint, absolutely not. You know, I think going to Ilri and building on the livestock work that I had started in my PhD, um, Ilri was the natural kind of link. And yes. being able to have that kind of platform to engage not solely with economists, but across different sorts of livestock disciplines. Um, Ilri made the most sense by far in that regard. Um, you know, I, I remember talking to, to Chris Delgado, um, who was joint appointed at the time with Free and Ilri, and when, when I had first joined and, you know, he was sort of kicking himself saying it's like, you know, because there was, a, I think, a postdoc that had been advertised like about a month after I had accepted the one at IFPRI. And he was like, I mean, you know, this is the perfect job for you. You, know, you should be doing this, not that. Um, and th that's actually kind of the genesis of, of, of my move over Dilry, in fact, kind of crystal yeah. out a little bit. Yeah. In fact, um, I've got some, I, I was going through some old emails from Chris yeah, yeah. Uh, to, to me when he, Chris wrote, wrote to me and said, I think I found the pattern the person who you were looking at uh, for because uh, we had a colleague from Uruguay who was uh, who was helping us on some of the right, economics right. reporting. That's right. So, so uh, from that standpoint, absolutely not. Um, yeah. I mean, Ilri does have a platform, sorry, IFPRI has a platform for policy, but IFPRI is a different place. You know, I've had two stints at IFPRI, once as a, as a young research assistant and then once as, as the postdoc in India, as you mentioned. And in those seven years in that gap, it, it really has it really has changed and it's changed even more. And not necessarily for the better, you know, I, I think it's become a little bit too, you know, kind of, kind of, I don't know, let's do, I don't know, the right political word for it, just be recorded. Um, but, you know, it, 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 it isn't sort of as researchy and academic and as maybe, say, let's say, collegial as the first thing that I remember. I, mean, I remember, it, you know, as a, as, a, as a 25 year old RA, you know, being able to sit in Chris Delgado's office, you know, for an hour. And just talk about things, you know, you know, and and he would just you know, have his time and, and just kind of you know, we, 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 it'd be like being at a university. And okay. if then was 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 a really something. I mean, as a young kind of emerging scholar, to be exposed to that was a really great experience. 
Okay. Be afraid today is different. Be afraid today is okay. like a big consulting firm. You know, it's That's it's good. a very so stressful it's place. Feeding more it's, it's into, not, in, feeding yeah, more into yeah. the World Bank and, and things like this. Yeah, the, the yeah exactly. The, yeah. The bank. Okay, I want to go. I want to keep moving. Uh, you then went into you went then went to the American University in Cairo, uh, uh, which was a sort of a bit of a uh, it, which was interesting. I mean, uh, I wonder what when we met there because I was leading the uh, the independent evaluation of the interna FAO's international responses to bird flu, and I remember. I remember meeting you there. Uh, that was what do you looking back on that? Where did that fit into your to, to your career development? What were the, what were the positives about that? The positives were, were kind of giving me that sort of sample of academics that, that I hadn't had, you know, in terms of being a teacher and a, and a lecturer. Um, you know, I did not have an opportunity in my in my graduate program, you know, whether masters or PhD, to teach. And one of the things that I did enjoy, you know, both at if at IFPRI as well as at ILRI in the time there was the training programs I was able to give. One of the first okay. things I did at IFPRI um, when I joined um, in, in 2005, um, I, I think the next day when we, when we arrived in Delhi, the next day we got on a plane to go to Colombo and I gave a, a one week training course in Sri Lanka to a group of, um, of South Asian, some mid-career South Asian policymakers on, on economic modeling. And I had an absolute blast. It was so much fun. I mean, just kind of <laughs> training and working with students and, you know, they were enthusiastic. It was just, you know, it was just such a wonderful experience. And I had a number of other, you know, programs like that while, while at Ilri as well afterwards. And, you know, I, I did sort of see that there was something in my career that I wanted to see, so is that something that I could do? You know, because, you know, that kind of engagement with, with students, that's commitment okay. to learning, that mentorship, you that's something that was there. You also had that because you then went on for four years for the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs, uh, mm -hmm. uh, which was, again, a bit different, sort of a bit uh, uh, left field, I mean, given or, or, or not. I mean, uh, you, you, I, I, it was fantastic because we had become, uh, we become heavily involved in, in various things. Uh, and so you, I got invited to do a couple of collaborations with you and you were heavily involved in Namibia. I did a something for the Institute on uh, on the trade in flowers out of Ethiopia, Kenya and Tanzania, because Norway not being in the EU. And that was fascinating uh, uh, for me. What so Norway, tell me about that. You, you, looking back on that, and where did that fit into your uh, into your overall contribution? Um, yeah, um, at the time, I mean, I mean, so, so, so going to Egypt, I mean, the, the experience in Egypt was, was, was positive in the sense of, I, I really enjoyed the teaching. Um, living in Egypt and commuting an hour and a half each way in Cairo traffic was not so nice from a quality of life standpoint. Um, yeah. I mean, it was physically just exhausting. You know, I, I, you just come home broken every day. Um, and so, you know, it, it was really kind of a partly mental health, just to kind of get to somewhere probably a little bit saner, but then also to have an ex kind of a, a place where I could really try to consolidate out my research. And one of the great things about, about being in Norway was the freedom. You know, your, your remit in Norway was, you know, if you, if you have the funds, you can do whatever you want. Yeah. There was, I mean, there, I mean, it was as horizontal as an organization as, as, as it gets. You know, you know, we, you know, we've all the perform, performance evaluations at Ilri and this kind of stuff. A performance evaluation in Norway was, is everything okay? Yep, okay, we'll talk next year. That was it. <laughs> so an incredibly laid back, open, free place. And a okay. great place in terms of collaboration with Ilri to really build up some of this kind of systems modeling stuff that I've been working with with colleagues. You know, that was okay. a great opportunity to do that because it basically I had, I had a chance to experiment we had funding from from Ilri. This is the, sort of the, the glory days of the of the first CRP, where you know you know CG centers were, were were flush with cash, and so there's opportunities to collaborate, and it was a great chance to to build that program. So okay. yeah, that was that that I mean, a yeah, wonderful. Certainly, I you I remember you were very very productive there, and you did, did all sorts of. Then it was Lincoln University in New Zealand again. Uh, 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 off you went. I, I I had one of the things I. Be always said yes to was uh, your inquiries or requests to be able to write references, and I and suddenly another one, a new one came up after New Zealand. So that was again uh, took me by surprise. Uh, you you were uh, assistant professor or associate professor of agribusiness, so you 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 were into a slightly different field. 
mm -hmm. um, fun or bureaucracy yeah, yes. or no um, oh bureaucracy sure I mean it's it's it's, a, it's um, you know it's a university so certainly some bureaucracy I was I was head of department for a little bit so there was certainly some interesting um, you know issues you have to deal with as far as department and other politics so so certainly that. Um, no, I really enjoyed it. I, I had some of the most fantastic students. Um, you know, 80% of the students in the Agribusiness and Rural Development Program were NZ aid students. So coming mostly from, from Africa and Southeast Asia and okay. who, were, who worked their tail off, who were really, really just, just a fun group to work with and to really see okay. how they grow. Um, the challenge of New Zealand was more on a personal level, especially for my wife um, in terms of distance. You know, our, our, our oldest daughter was born there and, you know, my wife being very kind of family oriented, you know, you know, checks are very, very kind of close to their family. That was really hard having the, the 12 hour time difference, you know, with their, with their grandchild. And, you know, that became, you know, difficult in many ways in terms of trying to manage that kind of distance. And so trying to find a way to okay. get closer and Okay, and then then it was Hillary again, and uh, and this uh, and back to your uh, foresight modeling and policy, and, and and first of all in Hanoi, and then and then off to Senegal. Uh, so I mean, you, you've got this nomadic uh, reputation, uh, uh, but what you've done over the last couple of minute, few minutes, is sort of give some uh, interesting justification and build the incredible experience. How, how, do you? I mean, it. it it's easy in retrospect to sort of build together and say, wow, this was a great package. But, but, but it, you were a nomad, uh, weren't you? To some extent, but I, I think there, I mean, there is a kind of a calculus of, of that, that process. Um, you know, there, there's, sort of, there's sort of some order in, 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 that, that, in that randomness in terms of what kind of what motivated it. And, you know, looking back on it, I mean, I don't really kind of have any regrets in terms of that process because I think it's built, been, allowed me to build, you know, what I've been able to do as a researcher today. And, you know, the, the opportunities that I've had, you know, to, to contribute to as, as, a, as, a, as an academic, as, as, as an instructor, as a researcher have all been shaped by that kind of collective nomadic experience. And, you know, you know if, if I didn't have had that, I think I'm not sure I would be as enriched as, as a scholar as I am now. Okay, um, there's an old expression that is uh, that goes back to the uh, to the 1600s about rats. In it was originally relating to a house, and then it uh, then it moved into the sinking ship, deserting the sinking ship. Is 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 that any component? I mean, I'm looking at really is you know, the disintegration of the of the CGIAR and. Uh, and, and, and the uncertainties of the different institutes. Uh, how, what, what do you feel about that? And what role does that play? Um, do I have concerns about one CGR? I mean, yes, I, I think all of us do um, to different levels. Um, you know, what did it actually mean for, for the, I, I really worry a little bit about, about what it means for the livestock agenda, um, that it doesn't get sort of, you know, kind of, reduced or kind of, you know, just kind of, you know, it's, it's importance lessened somehow. I mean, that, that does concern me a little bit. Um, you know, there are, I, I think there are some great opportunities in terms of the ability to collaborate, um, but the speed at which it's taking, the, the kind of, the, the frantic pace, the, um, a lot of the sort of the sort of disorganization of some of the processes, I mean, it is a bit of a concern. And, and I think it's a concern, especially in, in the role that, that I had at Ilry in terms of where that role will fit in, in the future. And does that role still stay with livestock? Does that role go to, to IFPRI? And there are you know, pros and cons of, of each, but that kind of uncertainty certainly you know, weighs on one's, on, on one's mind um, in terms of what that's gonna look like. Um, I think in the end, having a, a bigger organization like 1CGR you know, potentially should work, but it's, there's gonna be some, some bumps over the next you know, short term and probably medium term as well. And I do wonder looking at sort of a, of a counterfactual you know, if it would have made more sense for the CG to have maybe not been kind of one unit, but maybe kind of, you know, three or four or five kind of bigger units from a kind of a thematic standpoint. And so an Ilri, you know, combined with a world fish, combined with the livestock parts of other centers, that's kind of a mega livestock center or, man, or mega animal source food center. Um, and really using that as a platform for promoting the livestock agenda. 
um, rather than being kind of a, a player in a bigger, in, in a kind of a bigger setting where that agenda may not take as prominent a role as, as, as it does now. Because it, it's, I mean, the, it, the spectrum has changed so much. I mean, Ilri was comfortable in East Africa. Then along came, you know, 2005 or four or five, where Ilri was uh, out of Africa and it sort of moved and it was, so, and then, and then it's been struggling to find it, its position. Uh, and I remember on a, on a hard talk in 2006, where I talked to the different people who were outposted uh, in, in Central America or in, the, in, in Asia as to how much they felt part of that institute. And of course, they all said, yes, of course we do. And we just don't quite get all of the information. But I mean, it's, and, and now it's, it's emerged into something where Italy is still uh, floundering to try to find that international role and and links with other institution international international institutions so uh yeah we, where is it going well i mean it's, it's not gonna be part of one cg and, and maybe one cg will actually help with that in terms of helping to, to strengthen some of the links outside of east africa i mean to be fair i mean, I mean in, in west africa we are you know we're growing here we've got five people now we've we're hope, hopeful to get another couple people on board um in the, in the coming months so you know the so so the, there's there's definitely growth growth prospects in West Africa. Um, I think what Hung did in, in Southeast Asia when I was there in Hanoi, I think you know that that office has has grown quite well. Um, you know there there are challenges in terms of where the opportunities will be in trying to kind of follow you know follow those emerging activities. You know, a, a challenge in, in Southeast Asia, of course, is that Southeast Asia in in many capacities has 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 developed. You know Vietnam has has. Developed yeah. really, really strongly, you know. I mean, compared from the first time that I was there twenty three years ago, now um, it's a totally different place. And so, you know, trying to figure out kind of where we're positioned and, and to be flexible enough to actually, you know, be able to pivot to where those opportunities are. I, that, I think I think that's probably more of, a, of an issue that Ilri has in the regions, rather than its regional strategy as such. You know, I, I think sure. I, 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 I think we have done a nice job of expanding in some kind of core areas. I think we also need to recognize that sometimes those core areas actually do change, and some of those core demands change as far as where we need to be. But that is something that I think IFPRI does better a better job than we do. Like they they will open and close off like country offices depending on where the work is. Um, we have not sort of done that yet, and maybe that's something that we need to explore a little bit. You know, thinking about how do we need to scale up one office and maybe kind of de-emphasize another one based on what those needs are. What about the different uh, disciplinary components of, 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 of Ilri? I mean, I, I remember go, going back to an external evaluation of, of, uh, of Ilri a long, a long, long time ago when uh, someone said, get rid of the epidemiology, just bring in more economists, we need economists. And then and Ilri went through a phase of being overrun by, by, by economists. But, uh, but, and, and so this balance between different technical uh, skills uh, to be able to meet the demands of this new position that Ilri has at the moment. How, is, how does Ilri fit in terms of its, its composition and how well structured are, are these sort of technical demands of the new institute <coughs> made? Are they just off the cuff or is there some thinking going into that? I think the overall composition right now is I mean, in terms of like, you know, the balance between social scientists, um, epidemiologists and so on, um, I think on balance is, is not too bad. I think the, the bigger problem is I think we're probably short staffed across the board. You know, the amount of stuff that we're doing in terms of the demands on, on, on ILRI and research staff time, I think is, is, is huge. And we probably don't have enough people across the board, whether it's enough vets, enough economists, enough animal scientists and so on. I think we certainly need plenty more people. Um, just to help to, to, to kind of just support what we do. Where I think there, there probably could be a, a bit more kind of inter, what's probably needs probably a bit more integration. Um, you know, we're still a little bit siloed in terms of, you know, especially like on, 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 the, on the health work. You know, it would be nice to see a bit more, more integration across some of the, the health work and maybe across some of the things like genetics and otherwise, where we can actually have, you know, a proper integration of social scientists within the different types of technical disciplines. I'm not sure we, we do as good a job as we could. I, I think we're getting there. And I think there's a lot of goodwill towards that. 
you know, so talking to, 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 to colleagues, you know, in, in, in different programs, different groups, I think people do recognize the value of working together. I think it's just trying to find those opportunities to do that. Okay, we, we, um, we, we spent some time in uh, working together in, in Ethiopia on, uh, on commodity-based trade, and there was also some different consultancies we did on that. Uh, where is commodity-based trade th these days? I mean, I remember going through uh, on the different things, structuring the different disease constraints and the different opportunities, and you did a great job in analyzing the dynamics of, of, of livestock product trade. Where, where is that as a, as a force now, or is it no, is it, is it no force? I think it's there. I, mean, I think it's something that that's OIE and trading partners really need to decide what they want to do with. I mean, there's certainly an advocacy group for commodity-based trade, and you know, you know, Gavin, who just recently passed on, was one of the champions of that. But there's been others in Namibia that that have really tried to be focused on this, to, to focus on this. Um, there's some work, and, and, and you know them pretty well. Um, Andres Paris is doing some work in East Africa right now, um, looking at you know the potential for for you know, for exports from, from East Africa of livestock products and trying to, to do some participatory risk analysis to understand these kinds of things. Um, and I, I, I do think that one of the, the benefits of the work that we did was to really kind of move the needle in terms of, of, of that discussion, that it's not just technical and that commodity-based trade is only an initial step and it's not the, the full step. And, and I've, I've, I've had some, some one of Andres' PhD students who I'm, who I'm supervising, um, we, we have these long debates about this because Andres is convinced that, you know, oh yeah, we can export all this meat from Uganda, you know, to, to the Middle East. And I'm thinking- That's right, he is, yeah. It's not gonna happen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and his, students, his, his student has done actually a great job. She's, she's done some work look, trying to measure the prevalence of FMD in different production systems in, in Uganda. And, you know, it, it's pretty shocking. I mean, the, the, the estimated prevalence of like uh, of FMD from like pastoral systems is just, you know, yeah. through the roof. And then sort of like looking at this, and, 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 but then trying to weave a narrative about this saying that, you know, you've got a lot more problems than exports. And Andres tries to say, no, but we could actually handle this. And it's been like, mm, not so much, right? So. I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna show you something. This is, so this is. Uh, we got that uh, photo. Uh, Where's the photo of Simeon? <laughs> this is uh, you in a slaughterhouse in, in Ethiopia during that uh, uh, during that moment. Uh, if I then go on, uh, this is you looking in a much more comfortable position in uh, in the uh, Cavalry and Guards Club in London when we were discussing the finalization of the Uruguay study, and then and then this is in Montevideo uh, in uh, Uruguay. Uh, when we were finalizing that and so that brings me uh, what I what I wanted to bring that in to say is that Uruguay study which we completed uh, was uh, a return for you to foot and mouth disease. Foot and mouth disease and South America was where you got your PhD. Two Jarvis was uh, was was, a, uh, was your one of your mentors. Uh, uh, how where where did what did the Uruguay is the Uruguay study uh, where does it fit in the in the products that you have been involved in and, and, and other institutions? I mean, that, that, that was a real kind of kind of a culmination of many of the things that, that had been previously, right? I mean, it, it really combines some of the PhD work from long ago, the commodity-based trade work, a lot of the sort of the policy work. I mean, that was a fantastic experience, as, as you're well aware. I think we had a great time. Um, engaging with 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 government there, and and, it, and it's sort of a unique experience too. Um, you know, the, the, the Uruguay you know, government is you know the capacity is very strong. They're very committed. They ask you know very tough questions, but you know they really are you know they really you know use this evidence to kind of help to shape their their policy, whether it's going to be you know accepting what we've come up with or not. They, they've been a bit more conservative than than we've suggested. That's fair enough. You know, at least they had this information, you know, that they could use to make, you know, a, 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 an evidence-based decision. And I think that's one, one of the real strengths. And one, one of the things I'm really happy about that, um, about that study. The one thing that, that, you, that you did not mention about the second photo with me in a tie is, is Jonathan Russian being, being kicked out of the, the Calvary Club because he didn't have a tie coming in. <laughs> That's right. And he had jeans on, I think. He had jeans like and the guy was that's just not on with that. He had like <laughs> walking like an hour back to his hotel to like to change. Yeah. Yes, well, that's it. Um, one of the things that has, uh, that has affected us all and, and possibly has affected the, uh, the 
taking decisions based on the study in Uruguay, but globally is the uh, is COVID-19 uh, and, and so on. Tell me about the work that you've been doing or others in Italy or what you might may be doing in the future on the economics of COVID-19 regarding to uh, smallholder uh, livestock settings and, and livelihoods, etc. I mean, what, 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 is, what is going on and what is the future for that? Because it must have had an enormous impact, but it's dissecting all these bits and pieces out. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Isabel is a better a better source in terms of some of the stuff on the, the kind of value chain side to, to consult on this. I mean, my group has not done as much as we probably could. Um, you know, we've we've done a little bit. I mean, we're part of um, a COVID hub that uh, that Holmes Holmes helping to lead, or we're trying to understand um, some of the the drivers of, of of wildlife trade and how that actually contributes to to COVID to the, to the potential outbreaks of things like COVID and to understand ways of trying to, to mitigate those risks. Okay. In the so we are contributing to that, which I think is really exciting. Um, we haven't done as much on the modeling side. And, you know, part of it is it's because we're just pretty much flat out on, on everything else. Um, IFPRI has taken a slightly different tact on this. And basically, I think IFPRI has basically dropped everything to like kind of do all things COVID last year, um, which we haven't. Um, is that a good or bad thing? I mean, you know, that's kind of remains to be seen. I mean, I think at some point we will have to kind of reflect a little bit on this and, and have some types of foresight analyses that maybe kind of look back. Um, but part of our, our challenge has been simply having the, the resources to actually kind of be able to, to engage in those kinds of things. So, so we, we have been strategic. We've done some things in Vietnam, as I mentioned. Um, Nadam, before he left, did a, a nice little study trying to look at some of the, the effects on the East Africa, um, trade to the Horn of Africa. Um, and, and the impacts on the Hodge and so on that, that, that just came out a few months ago. So we've done some, some small things, but we probably haven't got, probably haven't engaged as much as we could. Um, and so, you know, that, that's perhaps a missed opportunity, but part of it's also just you know, the nature of what we're doing. We've got just so much going on and it's difficult for us to say, okay, we do COVID, but not a lifestyle master plan. So okay. these are the kind of steps we've had to, to make. How will your your work in the moving on to Oklahoma, how will the engagement with some of the important international organizations, the FAOs, the OIEs, uh, the, the, how will that be affected? Presumably there'll be a, a, a lot less, or, or, or am I wrong? You mean in terms of from ILRI or from... from no, the... in terms of from you, your, yeah. Your um, new job, you will. You'll be, it's, going, it's going to be more academic. Uh, more, so, more uh, yeah. yeah um, I mean, less, less, to, less on one level. Um, you know, one thing I, I do want to to hope for though is to try to engage more students at some of the networks that I've had. And so to the extent that I can actually work with, you know, to bring my master's students into some of my research and, and NGO and other networks. Uh, to kind of build their careers, um, kind of to work with them as advisors, as mentors. I mean, that, that, that is an area that, that I will cultivate. Um, but in terms of like direct kind of, you know, doing kind of consultancies or, or those kinds of things, I mean, that will be less, at least from a direct standpoint. Um, I, I do plan to be kind of a kind of a puppet master behind the scenes though for, for, for others. Okay, so I mean, I having been working in a development agenda, you're now going to a comfortable academic position uh, in in a yes university. Uh, uh, so, uh, which is sort of doing research that is, uh, but not, how do you make sure that you still keep this connection with 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 impact and linking to the sustainable development goals and, and, and this type of thing? Um. My work has always been applied and it's always been kind of focused on, on kind of current policy issues. And so, so because of that, and because of, of that kind of focus of being very practically oriented, I don't think I'm gonna sort of devolve into the, the esoteric and the kind of academic as far as what I do next. And it will be trying to work again with students on themes and, and, and research problems that really have an applied type of problem that actually solve a problem and aren't just trying to add a variable to a regression, for instance. And so, I mean, it, it will be a challenge to try to, to make sure that I, I keep those 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 contexts current, and that, that's something that I will have to, to balance. Okay. But I don't see myself, you know, kind of all of a sudden doing theoretical research that has no bearing on on anything. I mean, that's just that's not what I'll be doing. Okay, um, I, I'm looking at time, but my last question before maybe other people might want to ask you that, but the, the economics of, uh, of 
of working equids in agriculture and smallholder settings uh, th throughout the, the uh, doesn't seem to exist. And, and as you may know, it's one of my uh, one of my favourite uh, things. Yes. And we're I'm writing <laughs> something at the moment uh, about this. So uh, I, I was when I was in Colombia in the end of 2019 and seeing these diverse settings. You've got the coffee uh, and, and the role of horses and mules. You've got the, uh, the sugar cane. Uh, you've got the water down at the coast and the, and the role of donkeys. Uh, you, you've got uh, potatoes being moved and the marketing there. I mean, that's just a little cameo, but it's, it is so important and it's just not on the development agenda. Is that, and because there are no figures, there is not anything to link in the, 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 these different enterprises with livelihoods and, and to, to encourage more. What is your view about that? Am I just, is it just a fantasy of, of mine? <laughs> I, I, it's an important sector. I mean, I, I mean, I'm reminded of it every day in West Africa. I mean, the, the, the yes, number of, of working yes, efforts you see, you know, I mean, there, there are donkey and horse carts everywhere. I mean, they're the ones that, that, that bring kind of small supplies, you know, from place to place. They collect the garbage. They, there's so many things that you see, yeah. you know, a role for, for, for working equids. Um, I guess one of the, 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 the issues is sort of what is the, what's, 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 what's the intervention here? What is the sort of the, you know, what is the end game? What, what, what are you trying to move towards? I think maybe that question hasn't been very well articulated. You know, understanding the livelihoods and understanding kind of the, the contributions, you know, as sort of a baseline kind of set of information, I think is really important. And, and, and as you mentioned, you know, lacking. But what do we use with that information? What is sort of that, you know, you know what is the, the sort of the next step with that? And perhaps, you know, trying to, to, to articulate a bit better, you know, where we're trying to intervene or where we're trying to promote to, to allow that agenda to emerge, I think would, would, would help that quite a bit. Okay, okay, fair, fair comment. It's, uh, um, uh, I, I, Isabel, I'm I just very conscious of the fact that other people may want to make a comment or, 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 or question, um, but, uh, but certainly been, uh, I, uh, I've gone through uh, a lot of my notes and uh, um, uh, yeah, I look back at uh, this, this was a momentous thing, by the way, of, of, of yes. also, which was, uh, which was doing the that that great gathering of uh, of people looking at foot and mouth research needed for endemic settings in developing countries, which you were you were a huge part of. Um, uh, Isabel, would, uh, would you like uh, uh, to open the floor? Yeah, it's great. Thanks, uh, thanks, uh, Brian and Carl. Obviously, I think we can uh, all uh, clap virtually or not uh, <laughs> on that, very, very much uh, appreciated. Thanks, uh, Carl, for your insight. Some people are saying that we should do it uh, more often when people are not leaving so that we can get to know <laughs> each other better. So <laughs> thanks, Brian, for that.